so welcome everyone. As I said, this is an intellectual property and science literacy class. Um, what we're going to do for the first little bit is uh, go through an introduction to law. We're already a little bit late for that. And then we're gonna talk about uh, gene patents in particular. So patents that affect the genetic code in your body, an area that I work on, but it illustrates some of the ethical issues, legal issues, and intellectual property issues that you would get if you took an intellectual property course. Unfortunately, you're not gonna do that this year. That's a second year course, uh, but I'm hoping to give you a teaser so that uh, perhaps next year uh, you will join us uh, or work for our center or work for those uh, uh, of us in the center. Um, so let me get to it. Okay, so we each, um, sorry. IP law is a tool that uh, helps us achieve certain goals, much like everything else you're gonna study in law. Our particular approach at McGill is a little bit different than others because we have civil law and common law. We do comparative law. And we also understand, and this is part of the trans-systemic system, that law is embedded in culture. And so we're not just looking at it as a separate item, but as something that's really embedded in history, in context, and so on. Okay, so uh, as I said, this is, there's a little bit of a selling feature and then you can ignore it. We're always looking for students. Uh, this year will be a little bit different. We're gonna have a low level of activity, but certainly as you come out of first year and you're interested in pursuing research in the, this area, please contact me or my colleague, uh, Pierre-Emmanuel Moise. As of today, I'm uh, the director of the Center for Intellectual Property Policy. Uh, Professor Moise was until yesterday, and then I was, uh, was the original director many years ago. Okay, so what I want you to do now, and I'm about to put you into small groups, is um, just go through what you've done today since the moment you woke up. And I just want you to keep a list and I want one person in your group just to be taking notes, uh, not talking. And uh, in about uh, 10 minutes or so, we'll come back and I'll ask those people who took notes just to tell me things that you encountered today that involve law, right? Anything that involve law, just give me an example. And my guess is you will get about an hour into your day and you'll realize how much law has been an impact on you. So go into your small groups and I'll pull you back in about 10 minutes. So the point of this was not that we have a complete list, but you quickly understand that when you go through life, you are encountering law almost at every moment. Everything you do, everything you get on, everything you wear, everything you consume is governed by law. It's overwhelming if you actually had to think about it and ask yourself every moment, can I do this and who, who gets to prevent me? Uh, so the way we teach it is we, we give you silos, we put them into little boxes, but remember always that it surrounds you and all these things are happening to you simultaneously, right? So you talked about an animal, an apartment, so you're dealing with who owns the building. It, might not actually be your landlord. It might be, you might be dealing with an agent of the landlord. So there's agency law. And then you own your dog. Uh, what's the right of the dog? What regulates that? And it's really complex. And just remember, it's always going to be complex, even as we simplify. And the world of intellectual property, which many of you touched on, is equally complex. And people sometimes just look, because it's easier at the narrow silo, and say, well, I understand it because I understand these few rules. But in fact, those rules are existing in a larger society. And while we can only teach you part of that, you need to always focus on the fact that you know, these are interacting. It's also true that one intellectual property right may encounter another intellectual property right. So some of you, you know, some of you were talking about coffee, sometimes at my uh, suggestion and not. Uh, so the coffee, uh, will have, you know, possibly a patent right about how to make it, possibly if it's a new kind. It will have an image on it, which is su subject to copyright. It will have a logo or a name, which is trademark. All of them are acting simultaneously on the same object. 
And so you all, even though we think about these separately and there's separate lawyers who deal with patents and separate lawyers who deal with copyright, you have to remember all of this happens at the same time. Okay, so I'm gonna take you quickly into patent law, which is my area of study. And I spent a lot of time on uh, biomedical science in particular, and a little bit in agriculture as well. Uh, so patent law applies to things called inventions. And I'm, I'll take you quickly on the next slide to what invention is, but it's not a very helpful definition, I'm warning you in advance, which is often what you'll find in the law. An inventor applies for it. You don't get it automatically. You have to ask for it. And you do it on a jurisdiction by jurisdiction basis. So if you want a Canadian patent, you apply in Canada. But it's no good in the United States. And if you get an American patent, no good here. There are some international mechanisms to make it easier. But essentially what a patent gives you is you've got uh, some idea about how to make something or the object itself and its characteristics. You can stop other people from um, making it, using it, selling it, or importing it into Canada if it's a Canadian patent. And the reason we give this is we want more stuff. We like iPhones and we like new brands of coffee and we like our t-shirts and we like those type of stuff. And so we want people to produce them. There are many ways and many reasons people produce things. One of them is they get money from it. And they get money not as a prize, because you know some people go after a Nobel Prize, uh, but others, they have to spend a lot of money to develop a drug or to do something, you know, to set up contracts. And so we have to give them incentive, but the government doesn't want to pay for it in advance. So we give them this right to tell everybody else for 20 years, you're not allowed to make, use, sell, or import that thing. And then you have the opportunity to make money off of it. So that's the rationale for it. It sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. Um, but we also have to recognize that if I give you a patent right, what happens if you just sit on it? You say, I'm not gonna make this and I'm not gonna let anybody else make it for 20 years. The rest of us suffer because we don't have access to that. We could have produced it ourselves. We know that often the same idea arises in you know, two people's minds almost simultaneously. So we'd be blocking them. What happens if my thing kind of works, it's not so great, but you have an idea of how to make it better? Well, my patent can stop you from doing that. And so how do we manage all this and, and contracts and other ways help mitigate some of these problems, but there is a cost imposed. So the advantage of patents is it provides an incentive, but it also imposes a cost. And as I, you know, I'm preparing my intellectual property course. It also doesn't impose those costs and those benefits on the same group of people. So some people get really rich and some people do without. Some people who have ideas aren't protected by patents and, uh, and therefore other people could use it. So there's lots of questions about equality and access to the system, um, but that's the basic argument in favor of it. So you apply, it goes through a process where uh, a, a patent office in Canada, it's the Canadian Intellectual Property Office, reviews it. There are certain criteria that have to be met. You'll have to wait till next year to get to those. Uh, if they give you a patent, it lasts for 20 years from the moment you ask for it, subject to a court saying, no, the patent office shouldn't have given it to you. And that actually happens quite often. So for challenge patents, which are obviously a small percentage of all patents, around 40 to 50% are ruled invalid. So just because the patent office says you have a patent doesn't mean it will stand up. There are many reasons why it might not. Okay, so what is an invention? As I said, this is not a very useful uh, definition. Uh, so it's a new and useful art process, machine of manufacture, composition of matter, or an improvement. So basically it's a way of doing something or the thing itself or any improvement. But what, what is an art? What is a machine? What is a composition of matter is not defined in the Patent Act. And so courts have to try and figure out looking back at history, going back to the steam engine and looking at the eraser on pencils uh, hundred and some years ago to try and figure out what does this all mean? 
And while we have similar definitions around the world, each court system might interpret those words differently. So I'm gonna give you a case that I was involved with. We were uh, representing uh, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario to fight against patents over human genes. And uh, the case involved a condition called long QT. You probably heard of athletes in their late teens, 20s, uh, and they suddenly just collapse and die from a heart attack. Often, not exclusively, but often that's because of long QT. It's an irregular heartbeat um, that has a genetic cause found in about between one and 2,000 and one in 2,500 people. So it's a rare disease, but it's a common rare disease. And as I said, leading form of uh, sudden death in young people. And often the way we know you've got it is you've died, which is not a good outcome. But we can do a genetic test to find out. Right? So there's some people we can do an electrocardiogram, but that doesn't even find everyone. So the only real way to know before something bad happens is to go in your body, take your saliva, take your blood, put it through a machine, PCR machine, and see whether you have the, the, the right gene, the right uh, allele to uh, cause you to have this increased risk. So... Um, overall, people with this syndrome have a 10 to 40% higher risk of sudden death than the general population. Now, you may have this gene and never die. It just means you're at a higher probability of getting it, as I said. Relatively easy to test you, um, but there are patents on the gene and the way of testing it. And so what happened is this American company uh, had patents on this. And so Canadian hospitals were sending samples to the United States because they were afraid of being sued. The problem with that is there are multiple genes. It's not just one, they're different genes and they may be owned by different people. So that means I go to firm one and say, okay, do I have that particular type of gene? No, okay, then I have to send the sample to two. So that delays things and increased costs. Plus, I have to ship it outside the country, worry about privacy issues, and so on. Um, sorry, I'm not going to have time to, do we have time? Yeah, I think we do. Okay, so we represented the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario that wanted to do the test in-house. They had the complete capability to do so, uh, quality control, that was not the issue. But they were afraid of uh, being sued. So I want you to spend, okay, my time is completely wrong. Let's go until about 10 more minutes. I'll stick you back in the small groups, but discuss, you know, how do we balance the various issues here, right? Because it does take time and money to discover these things. What's the right resolution? Should there be some things that shouldn't be patented? So I'm going to send you back um, and, um, and, and let's see, I have to get out of the slides and put you back into your breakout rooms and I'll uh, drop in on you as well. Well, you did a great job because you, apart from the answer, and there's no one answer that everybody agrees to. In fact, in Europe, they have this answer and the exact opposite in the same statute, but that's for a different date. Um, but you raised the issue of scientific literacy. Where do we start? How do we interpret the act? Do we have, are we supposed to know the science? Um, so there are, issues around that. And then is this the only incentive available? Perhaps there are other incentives. What about the role of public universities that are publicly funded? Do the, does the knowledge that comes out of there uh, belong to the public? But hold on, there's still a lot of work that, that is needed to take that knowledge and turn it into a product. You still have to go through regulations, you have to distribute it, you have to build up the machines to do it. So does that change the dynamic? It's not an easy question, which is obviously why I asked you. Um, but that's the type of thing where you're supposed to do in law school is it's not that there is a single right answer. It's can you think about the different arguments and make sense of them and put them into a cohesive package so that you can say to parliament, mostly made up of people who have no science background, 
we favor this or we're against this because of these reasons. And can you switch sides? Because if you're a litigator, the best way to build your argument is to know what the person's gonna argue against you. So it's more the skills of the mental agility of understanding the different contexts where you don't have information. You know, some of you had scientists in the group, you can go to them and learn about it. Um, so how do you gather information and make sense of it? So that was the aim of the project and you did really well. So we're gonna take a five minute break so that I can get my two colleagues who have joined uh, formed into a panel. I'm gonna start the panel talking about some of the, you know, classic errors people make in science. And then we have a more open discover discussion about, you know, is science truth? Is it unbiased? Uh, so we're gonna open up to three of us and hopefully you guys can intervene. Uh, so take a couple of minutes and we'll be back. Yeah, okay. for sure. I'm hoping people are back. Um, so I think it's been about five minutes. Um, I've switched the types of screen sharing so you don't see my little bobbing head anymore. Uh, because of the effects and the slides, it doesn't work um, with the bobbing head. Um, so I, I will try and go through this relatively quickly and then introduce my colleagues, uh, Professor Ellis and, and Professor Jodoin, uh, to have a, a fuller discussion. So we already touched on this before the break, and that is that legal analysis uh, relies on occasion on science and on social science. I'm gonna package the two together because um, the differences are actually less for this component. We use similar methods. And I'm talking about social science that's empirically based, right? Not uh, discussions of, of law in general or, or so on, but uh, empirical studies that come out of this. And one of the issues is to recognize is that truth means different things. And a legal system must always generate an answer. If I go to a court, a judge has to say, this is right and this is wrong. They don't have the opportunity to say, look, you know, we need a little bit more evidence, go away, come back, we'll talk about it. They could say the evidence is not enough and therefore it's not true, at least today, and you have to start a new suit. But law gives an answer. Science never gives an answer. Right? So there is a tentative answer at any one time and going through the COVID crisis, we see that, do, you know, who gets it and how and how is it transmitted, aerosols or not. And it is constantly evolving and constantly open to challenge because of new uh, data uh, and new theories. So when you're looking at a study, when someone presents a study to a court or uh, using it in a, in a legal context, you have to determine how valid is it? How much weight should I give to it? And so you should look at a few things in the study, whether it's a science study or an empirically based social science study, like uh, an analysis of, you know, an economic analysis of the consequences of COVID or whatever. And you ask, what about the question? Is the question itself a valid question or does it inherently have bias, right? So when people were looking at the shapes of people's heads and trying to determine their intelligence, it was already biased that somehow that these two should be connected. And so the question itself may be biased. And one should also ask, is it relevant to the legal question I'm asking, right? So you could investigate whatever, but it actually doesn't, it's not, it looks, you know, important, but it actually doesn't help you answer the particular legal questions. So you have to ask, is it biased? Was it a well-constructed question? Uh, and is it relevant? And then you also have to look at how was the study conducted? Was the study conducted using standard methods that have been long accepted and tested? Or are they trying something new? One should be doubtful of both, but particularly of new methods uh, because they haven't been as subject to, to testing. So when you're looking at the study, you also should be looking at the data, right? So I could ask a very good question and use a very good method, how I did it. But I've got three people in my, uh, you know, I'm trying to test, is vanilla better than chocolate? And I test three people. I ask my two kids and my wife, right? I will get an answer. 
and it's a valid method, but it's useless. It doesn't mean anything because the sample is too small. And we often see that we have underpowered uh, studies using data from a too small a sample. Sorry about the phone. Uh, the data itself may be biased, right? So we know that AI applications that use data, uh, you know, start acting in a racist way because the data itself was racist, or I collected it in a in a way that is not unbiased. That is, I asked, uh, you know. 80 year olds, what's the best thing about school? Well, it's hardly relevant to what a kid in school today would feel. And then we have to ask, okay, your question may be good, your data may be good, but did the uh, data justify the conclusions? Did you push too far? So I, I asked three people whether they like vanilla or chocolate, and then I said, no one likes pistachio, right? Well. There's no basis for that, that I went too far. So you have to see, did they acknowledge the limits of the study? Uh, did they go beyond what the data can actually support? And I'll give you some examples of this in the COVID era. So you probably heard of the study that uh, the Trump government um, administration highlighted. You know, there's this study that all the studies had said that hydroxychloroquine was useless, in fact, dangerous. But this one study came out and said, no, no, it's good. And of course, the Trump administration uh, latched onto it. So the purpose of the study, this comes from the actual article, was to evaluate the role of this drug uh, alone and in combination with uh, azithromycin uh, in patients with COVID. And they found a positive effect. Okay, well, that sounds promising, but let's look at the method. It was an observational study. So it wasn't a, this is not a, in, uh, you know, using two cohorts independent where they set up the study in advance, they're looking backwards. So they didn't create the data sets equally. There's could be bias built into this method. And it was all patients admitted between March 10th and May 2nd, but it was non-randomized. And they looked at patients who receive hydroxychloroquine or in conjunction with the other medication uh, and asked the, you know, drew the conclusion that those who got hydro, uh, hydroxychloroquine actually did better. Well, that sounds promising, except why did they study hydroxychloroquine? First of all, there have been many studies that show that it was useless. So why were they studying it? Was there a political bias? Was there something else going on? And did they account for other factors that may have influenced uh, the results. So who was in the sample? Turned out the sample was mostly younger people. So of course you're gonna get a different result than mostly elderly people, right? It wasn't constructed to represent all people who could get COVID, it was observational. So they got who they, they did and it, they happened to get people who were younger. So of course they're gonna end up better. They also don't take into account the, pro the clinical protocols. There may have been rules that said, for example, if you're a certain age, you, the, either the person doesn't want to take the drug or they wouldn't administer it, it's in limited supply, right? They weren't doing this to study it, they just uh, were doing normal clinical work and they might have said it's not worth giving them. So of course the people who are on palliative care were more likely to die. And if they didn't get the drug, then it would look like the drug actually was beneficial. But what was really happening is it was, wasn't given to people on an equal basis because of the method they use. And also, by the, certainly by the end, treatment had increased. The, the capacity, you know, we, we understood ventilators aren't always needed and so on. And they didn't take that into account. So they didn't get rid of the co-founding factors. So in fact, this study is completely useless. The data set was biased. The method was not really very good. They didn't take into account, uh, so the data set was bad. Uh, they overextended their conclusions beyond what they observed and they went in and actually concluded that this drug that was bad for you actually is good. So that's an example. Now, if you're a lawyer and you get this, it looks, well, I'm gonna use this in my case, but this is a bad study and you have to, you don't have to be an expert, but you have to at least ask these questions. 
Okay, some other issues uh, to, to look at that are, are fairly common mistakes. First is that correlation is not causation. I'm gonna go through this. Um, the difference between a linear and exponential relationship, type one and type two errors, false positives, false negatives, essentially. And my favorite, data phishing or p-hacking. Um, and I've encountered this in my life and it drives me nuts when I see it. Um, first, here is a nice graph between consumption of cucumbers and deaths per million population from COVID. And there's a beautiful line there. So why not conclude, just eat more cucumbers? There is a correlation. If I put enough things together, I will find things that correlate with one another. It's inevitable, right? It, some things are just going to correlate. I think, you know, there are all kinds of weird and wonderful correlations. You can Google, you know, false correlate or correlations that don't mean anything. The problem is there's no reason to think that cucumbers will, will decrease death. There's no, when you approach a question, there has to be a theory, there has to be a basis for thinking there's a connection between the two. If you randomly just put things together, I think they also did onions and a bunch of other things, some of which did match, some of the, them didn't, but there is no causation. Eating cucumbers does not decrease uh, COVID. Now it could be that in countries where they happen to grow a lot of cucumbers and consume them, they also have a really good public health system. And maybe that's the thing that joins them, or they're just two random facts, none, neither of which has to do with the other. Another thing, and this is important during the COVID era, is the difference between, um, whoops, uh, a linear relationship and an exponential one. And this is really drives me crazy during the COVID crisis because we're all seeing you know, these numbers creeping up. Well, we don't have to worry because they'll just go up slowly. No, they'll be really, really low. And then suddenly they'll spike. That's what we saw in Southern US. And uh, the, on the left-hand side, you can see, you know, if you have a linear relationship and you, you, it means that it's regular intervals, if you took one meter and you did it 30 times, you would go 30 meters. If you did one meter, but exponential, you would have gone around the earth 26 times. It just grows so much faster. And that's kind of indicated by the, the graph on the right. So be careful about the nature of a relationship and don't assume that there's one size fits all. There are other relationships too, U-shaped and so on. But even if two things are related, they might not be related. You know, you can't just postulate, well, if I double it, I'm just gonna get twice the result. No, I might get thousand times result, right? Okay, other types of problems. Uh, So-called type one and type two. So a type one error, I don't know why. False positive. So we saw this not very long ago. The Ohio governor we saw had headlines. He was tested for COVID before Trump came to visit tested positive. Had another test a little bit later, he tested negative. Why? Because the test isn't infallible. And, and any study is going to find, you know, no matter how good your data set is, there are going to be some people who you think are positive or negative and so on. And this, this exists in every single field where things are, might appear true when they're not. And the opposite of this is false negative. Um, right, so there's one task, for example, you give it, 20% of the time it gives you the wrong answer. So that's a false negative answer. Okay, so my favorite or least favorite, depending on how you wanna put it, is data manipulation. And this, I was involved with this case. In 2013, going back to patent law, Eli Lilly, a drug company, sued Canada under NAFTA and saying that our patent law had a rule around utility, which is one of the criteria, and it was unfair. And they said, you know, if you look at all the cases, they got a junior lawyer with no science background to analyze all the cases uh, decided in Canada. Um, and they found that if you looked at the cases between 2005 and 2011, there was a sudden spike in courts ruling that patents were invalid because of utility. So that must mean, they said, that the courts change the rules. So causation, correlation problem. But there's also a, another problem. 
And the problem is the change that they said happened didn't happen in 2005, happened in 2008. But if they used 2008 to 2011 data, they would have found no change. So they had to backdate it to 2005. They also said the absolute number of cases went up, which is true. The number of, sorry, the number of cases invalidated because of this reason went up. But the problem is all the cases went up. There was a sudden rush of patent litigation. So the percentage didn't really change. It was, so they picked a data point that the number of invalidities went up, but they forgot the denominator. And what, they, what this is really about is picking your data sets to prove a point, but that data set is not neutral and is picked in order to prove what you want. Now they lost and the, and the tribunal threw this out. Okay. So the bottom line is what we think, this is the na natural progress of, um, of science. We think that you know, science uh, is stable, it's not. We thought kids don't spread COVID. Now we know they do. Um, and so uh, we have to be careful that the science will evolve even if we have to make a decision. Okay, so I'm gonna open up to my colleagues. I'll introduce them in a second. It, you know, we're gonna talk about these costs, these questions and, and a little bit broader. Uh, so let me introduce Professor uh, Jay Ellis. There, wave Jay. And Sebastien Jodoin, I haven't seen you. Where are you? Okay, so these are two colleagues working largely in environmental law. Um, uh, at least that's, I think most of your dealings with science will be in that context. Uh, Professor Jodoin also uh, teaches at the graduate level in terms of empirical methods. Um, and so probably repeated uh, in his class some of what I just said. Um, um, Jay, why don't I start uh, with you and, and talking about, I think, the issue you wanted to, which was bias and, and science. Okay, well, um, well, I guess one of the things that I, that I was interested in talking about was um, perhaps not so much bias, but uh, the idea of universal validity, which I think is very, very closely related. Um, so most of my work is done as is Professor Jodoin's at the international level. And the international level is particularly tricky in the context of law and policy because there isn't a community at the international level. There isn't a deeply held, broadly held consensus on values, priorities, objectives at the international level. I mean, there certainly isn't at the international level and um, arguably there isn't uh, such a deeply held consensus at the domestic level either. Um, we are talking about very, very pluralistic communities, both domestically and internationally. And when we get into issues like environment, sustainability, public health, people are going to have very different values and priorities that intersect with those, with those issues. Um, so what kind of problems does this create? Well, one problem is that we search desperately for the foundations for the validity and the legitimacy of law and policy and politics. So how do we, uh, how do we all agree that our laws are valid? How do we all agree that the objectives, broadly speaking, that they pursue are valid and legitimate? Um, how do we reach conclusions about the validity and the legitimacy of the decisions of political authorities, judicial authorities, legal authorities, and so forth? Well, increasingly, both at the domestic and the international level, we're beginning to realize that these questions of authority, legitimacy, validity are really very fraught. They're very, very difficult to get a handle on. Um, so, especially in contexts like uh, environment, sustainability, public health, because in any event, they are so heavily dependent on scientific, technological, and other expert inputs. Um, but also because we're, we're groping for some basis for grounding the validity of law and politics. Um, one of the, the things that tends to happen is that people are looking for some form of knowledge that clearly has universal validity. Now science appears to be the last, uh, the last one standing. Um, 
law, politics, religion, ethics, one by one by one, we realize that given the fact that we're living in a very pluralistic society, these are not grounded on universally valid conceptions of what is right, what is good, what is appropriate, what is fair, and so on. Whereas, especially those of us who don't work in the sciences, it can be a little bit too easy to conclude that science is a universally valid knowledge. So I guess one of the things that I wanted to, to kick around is uh, this idea of universal validity. Now, why, why do we conceive of science as being universally valid? For some good reasons and for some maybe not so good reasons. Some of the good reasons include the idea that a scientific conclusion or um, a scientific judgment, uh, because Richard, I completely agree with you that scientists don't reach conclusions in, this, in the sense of answers, this is the truth, this is a fact, uh, this is not the truth, this is not a fact. But a scientific judgment, and I use the term judgment very advisedly, um, should, be, um, should be valid or valid, subject to validation in one place just as it is in another place and in still another place. So, I mean, methodologies and approaches do very little bit, but we should be able to reach consensus about the cogency or the validity of a scientific judgment across the board. Um, Okay, so um, what, fair enough, that makes some, that makes a good deal of sense. And certainly we do hope that our, that scientists around the world can reach some consensus about the appropriateness of their methods and approaches. Um, we know very, very well today, especially in the context of COVID, in the context of climate change, that scientists are not marching in lockstep, that they do disagree and that they disagree for very good reasons not because they're bad scientists or biased scientists or because they are following inappropriate methodologies, but because the questions that they, are, um, that they are investigating and the means that they're using to investigate those questions are very complex and profoundly, profoundly difficult. So I, um, I wanted to get onto the issue of objectivity and talk a little bit about what objectivity could mean or does mean the variety of ways in which we could understand the concept of objectivity and maybe think about contrasting um, something like politics or law and the ways in which judgments are arrived at and conclusions are reached in those contexts with the ways in which we maybe assume or think that judgments are reached in the context of science. Um, I mean, I have a few things to say about objectivity, but I thought I'd probably just begin by putting that on the table. And um, I think it's very closely related to the issue of bias, but maybe getting to it from a slightly different route. So I'll stop there for the time being and just sort of put that on the table and we'll see how it goes. Great, uh, Sebastian. Right, well, uh, thank you so much for uh, the invitation to speak in this uh, master class. And I look forward to um, meeting some of you in your second semester when you, if you take Fondements de Droit with me. Uh, so I'm interested uh, in not disagreements between scientists, but in disagreements between scientists and other actors in society. So um, two areas of my work, one is in climate change, where there's lots of disagreement between policymakers and uh, what science tells us should be done to combat climate change. And also in the area of disability and healthcare, where there's tends to be lots of disagreements between uh, patients, uh, patient advocacy groups and what scientists do and how regulators approach these things. So the main uh, thing I wanna argue today, and I, I, and I would love to hear what uh, Professor Golden, Professor Ellis have to say about this. I'm, I would like to argue, so you, sometimes you hear this discourse that, oh, isn't it bad, isn't it so sad, there's this decline in the faith of science today that we've entered this post-fact, alternative fact uh, reality. And I'm gonna suggest that that's actually more in keeping with human history, and that this recent period, which we can date back sort of rising in the late 19th century and maybe declining in the late 20th century, where you had sort of large scale uh, public and institutional support and legitimacy for science in all sorts of ways, such as uh, public policy, uh, uh, you know, public universities, um, science being integrated into governance and decision making, science being portrayed as something that uh, will contribute to progress and human well-being. Uh, who here uh, has had the opportunity to go to Epcot Center? 
in their lives. I, I can't actually see. Can you do it? Can you raise your hand on the raise hand participate? I would just be curious if you if you've done that or is that like a too old fashioned kind of thing? Anyway, I remember going to Epcot Center at Walt Disney World in Orlando uh, and in the 80s and 90s and you go to that uh, Carousel of Progress ride and you can't help but think science is going to deliver incredible things, right? Uh, and this is also the period where you have scientists heroes, right? So um, examples are Rachel Carson, right? the uh, chemist who discovered that uh, synthetic pesticides were harmful to the environment and human health, who was sort of the dissident hero who published this book on spring, testified uh, at Congress and you know, the narrative is laws were changed and these pesticides went away, which is not exactly true, but you have the scientist celebrity, right? Albert Einstein, who is on talk shows, the cover of Time Magazine. I, I wonder today, you know, how many physicists are, uh, you know, actually appearing on, on talk shows who aren't sort of engaged in the full-time pursuit of um, uh, translating knowledge uh, for, for the public, right? Uh, and the science is that savior, right? So people in the, uh, in the 1960s, a lot of people knew who James Salk was, right? The person who was held as the person who uh, invented the polio vaccine, even though it's a lot more complicated than that. Um, so do, so anyway, I would, I would say that actually now in this current period where we see uh, contestation of science in all sorts of ways, I would argue that that's actually the usual, been the usual dominant way in which, which, which we've approached science. And that maybe this period in the 20th century is what's exceptional. Um, and so what are the, some of the things that were unique about the 20th century uh, that we don't have today? So one was monoculture, right? So we had a monoculture. There were three news channels, uh, uh, sorry, three, three TV channels. There were only you know, a, few, uh, a few magazines or newspapers. Uh, they were all uh, written by people who had similar education, ethnicity, uh, genders usually as well, right? Uh, this is much more complicated today with the internet. We don't have monoculture. And you also have a platform to promote alternative narratives for good and for bad to that monoculture. Um, I think another thing is in this 20th century, uh, in the second half of the post-war period, we see science deliver some pretty amazing and visible gains in human well-being. Like there's some really interesting uh, long-term graphs where you can see uh, uh, gains in sort of literacy, uh, uh, life expectancy, quality of life, and there's actually massive gains. Uh, not, not much happens for thousands of years, and then you have massive gains for around 50 years, and now we're stalling in some ways, right? So we've seen declining returns or declining visible returns. Um, we've also seen uh, way more science than before, right, around the world, even within society. So a lot more complexity, a lot more curation being needed. Uh, science no longer really being, if it ever was, a, something that an individual could do by themselves, but instead you have research teams um, that work together transnationally. Um, and two other things, uh, so th well, three other things that I think different. One is science has produced problems, not just solutions, right? So uh, whether it's pollution, whether it's leading to the development of nuclear weapons, whether we think of what are the most novel technological things that have happened in our lifetimes, Facebook, um, you know, TikTok, I mean, these things, uh, it, you know, have, they come with problems as well as whatever benefits they might deliver. And I probably would say they haven't have the same benefits as say the polio vaccine has had. But um, I think the wa wider narrative about progress, m modernity and capitalism that accompany the rise of science has really been questioned uh, over time. And um, as we are, you know, wealthier than ever before uh, in the West, as we have uh, access to more technology, more medicine, more knowledge, uh, we don't see uh, the same kinds of returns in terms of health uh, or happiness. And so this is a, this is a problem. Um, and then finally, uh, there have been some very legitimate questions that have been asked about the ethics of science. And there were definitely in this high sort of modern period uh, where we celebrate science, there were ways in which science was used uh, to, to really generate a lot of harm. So for persons of color, for indigenous peoples, for women, for persons with disabilities in all sorts of ways, whether it's uh, experimentation that was unethical, whether it's not including women in uh, uh, you know, treatments, um, study of treatments for different uh, illnesses and diseases, and you, and you then realize that 
your sample doesn't generalize, all of these things that occurred and also were defended uh, through science have for very legitimate reasons have been questioned. And so that's sort of what interests me in part is understanding this content contestation of science uh, today uh, and maybe what we can what we can do about it. Thank you very much um, to both of you for two provocative um, takes on science and and law and how it relates to society more generally. I'm wondering if I can solicit questions through the chat function. I think if we all speak at once, it, it won't work. So I invite you, uh, the students, not my colleagues, uh, to, I guess you two, uh, Jay and Sebastian, if you want, uh, to put some questions into the chat and, uh, and see where we're gonna go. Um, and I think there was some overlap, I'm just, you know, uh, waiting for some chat questions to come through um, between the three of us. And that is, there's a social dimension I think we all recognize to science that um, we, we often ignore. We either, we treat it in law as something that's unimportant and we make decisions without reference to social stu studies, um, you know, there, I, I, Another one study that came to mind, there was a study about a few weeks ago about the fact that black children did better if they were, uh, if their treating doctor was uh, black. All kinds of problems with that study, but it, it struck a chord because some people wanted it to be true. And I think we have to be careful about just thinking that really difficult issues about equality and distribution of resources can be solved simply by picking up a single study or series of studies. Uh, that science is not really designed to help us uh, ask questions that are really about justice, but they can inform us and sometimes uh, too easily um, uh, we, uh, we either ignore science or we don't, uh, or we overinterpret it. Okay, I have a couple of questions. Uh, so to uh, Professor uh, Jodouin, how do you separate science from scientists? Saying that science perpetrated harm to minorities or women could be problematic and incite distrust in science when science is at its roots separate from humans who conduct it. How much weight do courts give to scientific studies currently? Okay. Well, I thought on the harm question, I guess I'll say that um, whether, I mean, you could look at this in, 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 in different ways, right? You could say that, uh, you know, the ways in which the ethical safeguards that exist today uh, for, um, for governing science are perhaps part of the scientific enterprise, uh, right? Or part of the process of, uh, as, as, you know, as was the rise of science, the scientific method, as was the rise of uh, um, uh, peer review processes or, or the norm now in pharmaceutical research to have sort of randomly controlled trials that are across multiple centers and not just. So there's all sorts of, uh, you could say that that's part of the evolution of science. It's, uh, science. I, would, I do say, I, I would say though that um, one thing that does uh, interest me is, uh, you know, today the wide uh, chasm that can exist uh, between the production of medical uh, research uh, and the discovery of medical research, the way it's uh, reported in the media and uh, you know, whether it meets the needs or is aligned with the priorities of people who have illnesses that are supposed to be served by this, this research. I think there is a wide chasm uh, in, uh, and we see this in all sorts of ways. Um, maybe I'll just give a specific example that uh, relates to um, the, the field of multiple sclerosis, where there was in 2009, an Italian scientist that came up with this theory that uh, MS was caused by a blockage in the veins. Um, this made no sense in terms of existing scientific knowledge of MS being autoimmune illness. Uh, but he had done this experiment on his wife and there was all this reporting about how amazing it was. Uh, and at the same time, it's, it's fair to say that in the mid-2000s, the existing pharmaceutical treatments for MS are not great. They are almost only a little bit better than placebo. So there's a lot of distrust uh, in the community around what pharmaceutical 
research can deliver. And then you have this amazing story of this cure. And there's some research on this, it's called the hope cycle, where media will uh, catch on to, the, the, the media loves talking about cures. And so this was a cure. Now, uh, eventually there's grassroots parent patients advocacy that pushes the Canadian MS Society to fund a multi-million dollar randomly controlled trial, multi-centric uh, international trial on this, on this treatment. With a, against sort of the wishes of the scientific community, they do the trial. It is led by this doctor, Paolo Sandoni, and the result is this doesn't work, okay? Now, I remember at the time that uh, this, the results of this trial came out, I remember neurologists commenting and saying, I guess this puts this to bed, you know, this is over now. No one's gonna talk about this debunked uh, theory. And I, I suspected that would not be the case. And I went on to uh, the blogs of the patients who promoted this idea and their response was, you know what? There was someone in this multicentric trial who has gotten money from big pharma for other research. Therefore, this whole thing should be questioned, right? So again, I'm gonna suggest that there are legitimate questions to ask uh, about the involvement of, of how, how we produce um, research relating to medicine, how we, um, and then those are legitimate questions that we need to you know, do a better job of, of regulating and, and ensuring that the relationship between doctors and researchers and, uh, and pharmaceutical companies is transparent and, and ethical. I acknowledge there's more that can be done, but I also think that there's two other things going on here. One is uh, a basic lack of scientific literacy in, amongst, uh, amongst lay people, amongst uh, citizens. And one of my dreams is actually to run a randomly controlled trial where uh, maybe I would take half of the patients in, you know, given, who have different illness and like give them that training and see if it influences their decision-making or, or perception of, of medical research. It'd be really interesting to me because the reality is that I, I've known people who, who have seen you know, these studies that are done in mice uh, once and on that basis decide this is the right treatment or it's not the right treatment, it makes no sense, right? So there's that. I think there's also though, if you go online, you'll discover incre an incredible polarization between the people who 100% believe in science and think anyone who thinks any otherwise is foolish, right? Or, or misguided and the people who are completely suspicious of science and see it as a, a, a big conspiracy tied to, uh, tied to corporations. So there's lots of, I think, uh, communication that could be more effective that could be happening between doctors and scientists and, and the patient community. Uh, and I think that sort of, these are the kinds of things that I think we would need to uh, concretely look at how we, we could do that. In the field of climate change, there's 20 years of research on how you talk about climate change to people who don't believe in it or, or, ha, or are denialists. Uh, and I think we should see more of that kind of work uh, to see how you can reach, uh, persuade, engage uh, with people uh, where they are in relation to the science to, uh, to have a, a dialogue that actually empowers them uh, and, and it gives them voice in, in the process, but also allows them to do that in a, in a, responsible, a responsible way. So that's what I would say. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn to uh, to Jay. There's a question from uh, Nicholas Cameron. I apologize if I'm mispronouncing anybody's name. Um, and that is, how can law be a solution to the manipulation of data backed by corporate interests? So I'll let you interpret how you want to take that uh, question. Uh, so Jay? Well, I think the short answer um, could very well be it can't. Um, one of the really interesting things about uh, the objectivity of science and about the so-called scientific method uh, about the validation of science is that this is something that's very imminent to the scientific community. And there are good reasons for arguing that if you have some other social system like law or politics, making decisions about what counts as good science and what counts as good scientific method this would essentially corrupt science. Now it makes people very uncomfortable to think that we somehow need to trust scientists to, to validate the work of scientists, um, that scientific standards are somehow not objective in this very specific sense of the word objective, meaning just dropping from the sky, um, being essentially there, being essentially valid, before any community of scientists emerges. 
This is, I think this is one of the reasons, for example, why um, people hang on to the scientific method so much. It seems as though this is what, uh, this is the way in which we know that uh, the difference between good science and bad science, or the difference between science and not science. Whereas in fact, the scientific method is more or less what scientists do. And whether what scientists do is considered to be valid or not is actually left up to scientists. Now we could look at the question from another point of view, instead of trying to control scientists through law, which personally I think is a terrible idea, we try to control um, corporate interests through law, which is a fine idea, no problem with that. I mean, there could be all kinds of rules about the injection of funds into scientific endeavors, um, about the interactions between corporate interests and scientists, and I wouldn't have a problem with that. Um, but now, and I guess I should also simply say that I don't believe I don't believe that scientists should be left altogether to their own devices to figure out what counts as good science and bad science, what counts as science and not science. I do think that there are really important ways to build bridges to the rest of the community and for scientists and non-scientists commu to communicate with one another in really highly effective ways about what the standards through which science is validated might be. So there are really important bridges. And one of those bridges, I think, is this concept of judgment. Can scientists explain to one another why they reach the conclusions that they reach? Yes, they can. They do it all the time. Can the ways in which they validate their conclusions be translated or transmitted to non-scientists? Yes, they can. It's not easy, but it can be done. So I think that, I mean, one of the things that interests me is that, that process of bridge building. Uh, Bryce uh, Ladsdell asks, ethics and science experimentation is regulated through law. Do you view this as a form of law corrupting the scientific process? Let me start and I'll open it up uh, just because I'll give your voices a break. Um, there are different kinds of laws, right? So there's formal law and we'd actually have very little formal law telling a scientist to do this or that. Yes, if you want to meet regulatory standards to sell a drug, there are certain standards, but most of the standards we apply, including ethics standards, are normative in the sense of their soft law. Uh, and Jay, I'll, I'll turn to you because you're more of an expert on soft law than I, but soft law is a body of rules that we impose on ourselves through our communities. There may be sanctions, but you don't go to court to enforce them, right? So this, I mean, this is one of the unique aspects of McGill as well, because we, not that other schools don't look at this, but we spend a lot of time thinking about formal law, but also informal law. And um, uh, Rod McDonald, kind of the, one of our foundational leaders um, in this area, I remember he, he was talking about a young woman who comes from a Muslim family. Her parents say, you must wear a hijab. And this was an example in France where wearing a hijab in school is not legal. What is she to do? Because does she really care that, you know, one rule comes from the state and is enforceable through law and the other is informal, comes from her family? Not really. She's got a struggle as to which one to follow. Um, and so ethics rules fall into that category of norms that we develop, but don't have an official mechanism in the courts. They might have it through universities, granting agencies, uh, and so on, but they're much more informal and therefore more fluid. So I don't know, Jay, uh, do you have thoughts about the difference between formal and informal norms to regulate science? Well, the, these kinds of norms come from a lot of different places. You mentioned regulatory science. If you want, uh, if a substance is, is under consideration as a toxic substance and therefore subject to regulation, then yes, there are legal criteria for determining whether that substance is toxic or not. Same thing as you mentioned, uh, approval of, of, of drugs or uh, therapeutic treatments. There are legal and policy rules around how those, um, how studies that will be considered valid by governments, by regulatory agencies are to be conducted. So certainly scientists who are working within regulatory agencies have to follow rules about what constitutes good science. 
and they have to follow rules about what constitutes the kind of science that will get into the decision-making process around regulation. But if we're talking about scientists who are exploring for the purposes of expanding knowledge, scientists who work in universities and not regulatory agencies, whose, whose objective has much more to do with the expansion of human knowledge, actually those ethical rules are generated by scientists um, and they are policed by scientists through, for example, peer review, through, as you say, Richard, um, control over who gets funding, control over who gets to be uh, elected to positions on scientific, um, uh, the boards of uh, scientific societies and that sort of thing. Control over who gets to be considered the, um, uh, the star scientists of the, of the generation. So uh, these ethical rules are extraordinarily important because if scientists find themselves on the wrong side of those rules, they find it more and more difficult to do their work as scientists because they're denied uh, positions in universities, they're denied funding, um, they are denied places on panels at prestigious uh, organizations. And as you mentioned, Richard, with the example of the hijab, sometimes these kinds of sanctions can bite much more fiercely than anything that a government can dole out. You had asked earlier, Jay, um, how is science separate from scientists? I know you touched on it a little bit before, but do you want to expand about what you mean by that? Because I think it touches a little bit on what we just talked about, but what you talked about earlier. Yeah, um, so essentially my question is, is spurred by this idea that science is, it's an idea that is very, very prevalent in, in society today. It's very prevalent in, um, in a lot of the literature on, on science. It's, uh, it's an idea that has its roots, I think, in the 1930s, um, logical positivists working mainly in Vienna and to a certain extent in Germany. And for reasons that I um, am having a little bit of trouble understanding, despite the fact that philosophers and sociologists of science have debunked this approach again and again and again, most famously with Thomas Kuhn and his scientific revolutions, it has a real hold on the public imagination and it has a real hold on the imaginations of regulatory and political authorities. Um, and I suspect that this has a lot to do with the fact that these regulatory and political authorities are searching for some means to ground the decisions and the judgments that they're making. So what they want is for science to have an utterly independent source of validity. They want the source of scientific validity be, to be independent of scientists. They want there to be this sort of platonic form of science, predetermined, pre-established, into which scientists enter, uh, in which scientists participate. And this is understood in a very, um, I mean, I don't think that anybody would necessarily want to spell it out in this way. But if this were true, then scientists who follow these rules produce good science that regulatory authorities can therefore depend on to validate their decisions. This is a way, um, whether consciously or not, for regulatory, political, legal, judicial authorities to avoid exercising their own judgment and to avoid taking responsibility for that exercise of judgment. So I think it's actually very important for us to understand these norms about what constitutes good science as being imminent to the scientific community. And I also think that we are all entitled as members of society to hold scientists accountable to meeting these standards, but also to ensuring that these standards are robust and rigorous. There's a question from uh, Simon Ahmed Jeunet uh, to us all, not uh, specifically, so I might turn it to Sebastian to start. Given the challenge of ensuring that courts and judges are scientifically literate, because after all, they're us in a few years and most of us don't have a science background, uh, in an increasingly complex subject matter that they rule upon, is there a, rule, a role for uh, expert administrative decision makers? And we see a multiplication of those. Is that a good thing or a bad thing that we're moving some of these these decisions out of the courts and giving them to administrative agencies to deal with the more complex scientific and, and other issues. Uh, Sebastian, do you want to start? Yeah, I mean, let me let me address this this question from the perspective of climate litigation, which is a field that I work in. Um, traditionally, you're right. Courts don't have the uh, judges don't have the training 
there's all sorts of criticisms of the court as a, as a space where you can really plead scientific fact. Um, unfortunately, uh, fortunately or fortunately, uh, the science on climate change is so uh, clear and consistent uh, that uh, it's not actually been a challenge to uh, plead climate science in courts now. Uh, it was maybe 15 years ago, but it no longer is the case. And in a lot of the uh, domestic constitutional cases that have been launched in Canada, the Netherlands, um, there's a new one in South Korea, there's one about every two weeks now, um, mostly uh, the, the cases are relying on two things. One is this expert body set up internationally to provide an authoritative scientific uh, summary of key findings. And two, the science of and the um, conclusions of the government's own scientists. So um, actually what we're, the other thing I wanna say is traditionally administrative tribunals, it's usually pretty hard to overturn those decisions or, or to overturn the decisions of, especially of governments um, because of different doctrines that you'll encounter either in constitutional law or in judicial review of administrative action. But usually we give lots of deference to the judgments of ministers that fall within what we call political discretion or, or to, to these administrative tribunals, again, that fall within the area of competence. Um, however, we've seen in Canada, for instance, in the last two years, such um, failures on the part of governments and administrative tribunals to actually even consider evidence that we actually have seen decisions like the National Energy Board decisions get overturned time and time again, because they didn't even order a study on you know this the impacts of this pipeline on invasive species even though there's an, even though there's another law that says uh, not sorry uh, protected species endangered species sorry even though there's another law that says and another regulation that they're endangered species here right so the bar usually traditionally uh, you know if you talk to administrative legal scholars they'll say you know for most of the 70s and 80s courts always like ah oh, they looked at it uh, they you know we defer to their judgment and now for the last 10 years. Uh, our governments and these tribunals are doing such bad jobs, in my opinion, in even fulfilling the basic uh, responsibilities they have to actually uh, align with their, the conclusion of their own scientists that their decisions are getting overturned time and time again. And I think that's, um, to me, worrying for democracy. Uh, it's worrying for thinking about what the responsibilities of our governments are in relation to um, responding responsibly to science. And I will say that it's given a renewed enthusiasm in using litigation uh, in relation to these, some of these questions. Whereas previously you would have said, oh, you know, in torts, oh, it's so hard to prove causation with some certainty. But unfortunately with climate change, we've reached the point where actually it's, it's pretty straightforward and it hasn't been an issue in most of the new domestic uh, climate cases launched around the world. Thank you very much. And you're ending at a really good time because uh, we're almost up uh, our, our period and on Zoom, it's really important that because I have no idea what you guys have next, but you have lives outside of Zoom. Uh, amazingly enough, I'm hearing uh, my lives are going on upstairs, uh, stomping and so on. Uh, thank you, Sebastien. Thank you, Jay, for joining us uh, today. Uh, thank you to all the incoming students for you know, putting up with us. Um, you're stuck with us for three to four years. Uh, we hope you find it uh, interesting, amusing. We don't necessarily always agree. We didn't really have time today to poke at, you know, slight differences or big differences between us. And there are on faculty. We're a faculty like any other where there are differences uh, and points of view. But I'm hoping you get a flavor for, you know, the larger context in which we look at law, that law is not a bunch of rules. If you came if your interest in studying law is to memorize a bunch of rules, you came to the wrong place. Really what we're trying to do is look at law as an institution, as multiple institutions, and how it deals with issues of science and of climate and of gender and everything else. And it's complex and we draw on you know, philosophy and political science and yes, science. We do so skeptically. Uh, we try to understand the, you know, the, the advantages of each field and the disadvantages. Uh, hopefully not overestimating our own capacity to understand and balance, uh, but that's what you're in for for the next uh, three to four years. I hope it's enjoyable, even if uh, your first taste of it is on Zoom. Uh, 
I wish you luck uh, starting, I think, tomorrow, your official uh, classes. So the first week is to give you a basis in different areas of law. And you will be seeing some of us uh, perhaps next semester. Uh, you will not see me. And I, I think, Jay, you're not on till next year either. We're upper year professors. But it's really nice to get to meet you on your, the day before you start. So thank you all. And good luck.